My name is Thomas Groom. I'm a professor of theology and religious education here at Boston College. Uh, in fact, I'm beginning my 40th year, so it's hard to believe. I came just after I made my first Holy Communion. Uh, they hired me to teach, be a young professor, and here I am. Um, recently, I was honored and privileged to become director of Boston College's Center for the Church in the 21st Century. Uh, it's a wonderful initiative. Father Leahy, our president, launched it about 13 years ago uh, to be a catalyst and a resource for the reform and renewal of our beloved Catholic Church. And it has done wonderful work since then. I, I was happened to be on the different committees, but other than that, I had nothing. Deserve no credit whatsoever. Uh, but my good colleagues, uh, Karen Kiefer, Ellie Zapata, are really the mainstay of the center. And um, one of the best things we do is we publish a magazine called Resources, Church 21 Resources, uh, where we take a topical pastoral issue and find the finest essays and articles written about it recently. We find somebody, one of our faculty, that has competence in the area and then assembles the literature and even if necessary, boils it down to seven, eight hundred words, so that it's really creme de la creme uh, what we publish in resources. And the current issue is on our faith, our stories. It's on one of the favorite um, foci of the center is the handing on our faith and indeed the power of story and narrative and handing on the faith. Take a copy if you haven't already received one. And if you'd like to receive it regularly, uh, we mail them to people free. We mail 180,000 copies of this magazine uh, twice a year. The next issue, the spring issue, is on Latino Catholicism, especially as our Catholic Church and community here in the United States becomes increasingly Latino, and what an important topic that is for all of us. So uh, we do lots of very good things. This night, a week from tonight, we're hosting uh, Padre Gustavo Gutierrez, the great initiator of liberation theology. Uh, will be here. Uh, we'll actually be down in lower campus, but as our guest, uh, our lecture a week from tonight. So I'll put that on your schedule as well, 4 4.30 next uh, Monday. But tonight we have great pleasure. We're blessed to have with us Bishop Frank Caggiano, uh, the fifth bishop of Bridgeport, Connecticut, as of September 19, 2013. He'd asked me I, not to go through this, so oh, reluctantly I'm going to, be to merciful. relent. Uh, but just a couple of things about him. I mean, terribly important to know that he's from Brooklyn uh, and in fact came to Bridgeport having been an auxiliary in Brooklyn for about five or six, for seven years. Um, was a uh, graduated from Regis High School in New York. I should mention that. And actually was under the tutelage of our beloved uh, Bob Newton. Uh, which, of course, it explains why he's become a very successful, promising bishop and, and uh, so on, and obviously uh, imbibed the, uh, the Ignatian charism uh, when he was at Regis, and still is very seriously committed to the spirituality of Ignatius. Um, one of the first things he did upon getting to uh, Bridgeport Diocese was, in his opening sermon, was to say that he was there to build bridges. And um, a good friend of his, Pope Francis, was with us recently and obviously stole his line. Um, because, and since then, he has been building bridges, building bridges to survivors, building bridges with, with, uh, to alienated Catholics, building bridges to youth. Um, for the first time in almost 40 years, he held a diocesan synod that ran for a whole year with over uh, about 350 people, but over 300 of them were lay people participating in setting the, the future of the Bridgeport Diocese and what are the issues they should be dealing with. And again, came up with deep commitments to the, to the youth, to evangelization, uh, to the poor, to the works of justice. Uh, he's a bishop truly in uh, the spirit and heart of our beloved Pope Francis, uh, and has been indeed by many uh, people reckoned a real breath of fresh air uh, to the Bridgeport Diocese. He was, orda he was ordained for the Diocese of Brooklyn, um, has all kinds of other credentials. Uh, went to originally in, enrolled in Ye at Yale as a uh, po political science major, and then after a year or two, discerned the possibility of a vocation to priesthood, and uh, went on to immaculate conception. Um, and then, la after finishing college, actually went out and worked uh, for uh, almost two years for McGraw Hill, but then returned to seminary as ordained for the Archdiocese of uh, Brooklyn. And as I said, our beloved Michael Himes is one of his great mentors there. So 
I'm trying to summarise quickly because there's lots more I could tell you, but let me introduce and let us welcome warmly Bishop Caggiano. Thank you. Thank you very much. First and foremost, I thank you for that introduction and for the opportunity to spend this afternoon, maybe an hour or so together, to break open a conversation, and I do sincerely mean that. My job is really to begin to create a dialogue between ourselves about a topic that's very dear to my heart and I hope is dear to yours as well, flowing out of the phenomenon that Pope Francis is in the church. We're going to dig a little deeper and ask the question, what is it that this man brings to the church and to the world that fascinates so many people? Catholics, non-Catholics, and I would dare to say for the young people who are here, very much among the young church, he has captured our attention, our imagination. I have a thesis to propose, and feel free to take the thesis apart from your own experience. But before I do that, I have to make a disclaimer. I stand before you not as a theologian. I stand before you as a pastor of the church. And from my pastoral experience, both in Brooklyn and in Bridgeport, and my own experience in prayer and reflection, you are hearing the sum total of what I have come to understand, particularly in these last two and a half years. I also am here to ask questions. I like questions. I had a very dear friend of mine who now has gone to the Lord, an Orthodox Jewish rabbi, we were the original odd couple in New York City because we would go to dinner together. I dressed like this, and he also dressed, and we would go to Daisy's, the kosher restaurant in, in Midtown Manhattan, and we would talk about everything under the sun. And I remember distinctly a few years ago, we talked about education, and he said to me, he said, Frank, he said, it's interesting. He said, those of you who are not Jewish, in education, you are very much worried about giving the answers. He said, but in Jewish education, we are much more interested in asking the right question. Because if you ask the right question and have a commitment to the truth, you will eventually arrive at the truth. And I like that. So I'm here to ask lots of questions, and then we can pick them apart. So let me start with the first premise. Would you agree that Pope Francis has absolutely captured the imagination of the entire world? Anyone disagree, you can free to leave. No. <laughs> I think anyone who makes the cover of Rolling Stones magazine and The Economist is doing something right. And he is. He is. Now the question is, what is he doing? The Pope's recent trip to the United States was a great success. You could see it on the faces of people, their enthusiasm. I mean, I had friends wait online at Madison Square Garden for five hours, not a single complaint. My friends, that is miraculous in New York. Not a single complaint. Something is afoot. What is it? And if we can answer the what is it, I think there is a challenge embedded in that. A challenge for you and me. A challenge, quite frankly, that will remake ministry. And a challenge that has a direct impact on the ministry that we provide to the young church. And like all things Catholic, that which seems to be the obvious answer is usually the wrong answer. So let me give you two obvious answers. How many times have you heard in the press that this Pope is extraordinary because he is humble. Have you heard this? Would you agree he's humble? Absolutely. Living in the Domus Marta, giving away a lot of the trappings of the papacy, doing what it, going to pay his own hotel bill, getting his own glasses. I mean, I would love to have been a Piazza Navona to see the Pope walk into the shop. I mean, and it's authentic, my friends, you know that. This is not showmanship, it's from the heart. He is clearly a humble man. But let me give you this to think through, if I may. 
I do not believe that in our lifetime, at least my lifetime, there will be a successor of St. Peter who will do a more humble act than Pope Benedict did when he came to the conclusion he could no longer do the ministry God had asked him to do. So is Pope Francis humble? Yes. Is he the only pope? Not quite. There's something else at foot. So you will hear in the secular press, you will hear it in other places, that Pope Francis is a phenomenon because he connects with people. Absolutely does. Absolutely does. I distinctly remember in Rio de Janeiro that one moment when this, this man literally took his son and threw him at the Pope. Thank God there were people kind of like carrying the boy along the way. And the Pope took the young man by the shoulders and brought him forward and kissed him on the forehead. And the Pope heard the boy say something to him. And as the boy was being returned back, the Pope had turned the color of your sweater bright red. And there was tears coming down his face. And if you consider, there were 300 television networks, 4 million people watching. In that one moment, this man that the whole world was looking at, the only thing that mattered to him was that one boy. A man of, a man of faith and a man of the people, yes. However, however, I've been to Madison Square Garden twice in my whole life. A few weeks ago when Pope Francis was here and the time before that, was in 1979, exactly, when I did not do what the rector had asked me to do, which is go to Shea Stadium, and I went to Madison Square Garden. And I will not tell you what happened afterwards. That's another story. I went to see John Paul II come when he came to New York. Now, I have never, ever in my entire life felt human electricity as I did in that stadium. When John Paul entered that room, the entire place erupted. There was a bond between those young people and the Holy Father that I have never seen before or since, even considering Pope Francis. Now, does that make Pope Francis not a man of the people? Of course it does. But there's something else at foot. There's something else at foot that is making this reaction that is so clear, so authentic, and so widespread. Okay, so what in the end is it? Let me tell you a story as the entree into what I think is at least part of the answer, and only part of the answer. Recently, I had the occasion to sit with a number of young people, all of them, educated and committed, articulate and reflective. And inevitably, the one line arose that keeps coming up in conversations with not simply young people, but with many people in the church. And it goes something like this. Bishop, I understand about church. I understand about going to Mass. I understand everything I was taught. but. I don't know how to tell you this, but I'm kind of spiritual, but I'm not religious. Have you heard that before? Honestly, who has said that before? Don't raise your hand, just say it to yourself. Okay? I am spiritual, but I'm not religious. What does that really mean? Let me give you the Caggiano version of what that means. Spiritual equals me, religious equals we, meaning every human person is searching for God. That is embedded in who we are, and everyone is searching for God. The question is not the search for God. The question is whether I need you for the search for God. I can do it on my own. Or, if I'm not going to do it on my own, I'll pick the people that I will journey with. But tell me why I have to go into your community. Tell me why I should belong to your parish. Tell me why I have to put up with all of these crazy people that happen to go to St. Esmeralda, 
when I could just pick and choose whoever's going to be my companion in faith. I'm very happy being spiritual. I'm not too thrilled over being religious. Now, why do I tell you that story? I tell you that story because, my friends, my thesis is this. Pope Francis, for the very first time, is giving an answer to that question. Because when you cut away everything else he is teaching, everything else that he is giving the church by example, what he's really saying is, the time has come for the community of faith no matter what form it takes, to prove its credibility, to prove it's worthwhile, to prove it is worth belonging to. And people who have been searching for a very long time to belong to a community that they say is credible, is worth belonging to, are finally beginning to say, you know what, this man may be on to something. And even though he is not using that language, I am presuming to synthesize it in that language. And if I am correct, he is, in what he's proposing, what we do about it, is proposing an agenda of real reform that will challenge every single one of us in this room. So allow me to explain it briefly, and then we'll open it up for conversation, dialogue, and whatever else you wish to go with it. But Evangeli Gaudium, the Holy Father, says that the paradigm for the church is missionary discipleship. Does he not? And he has a particular way of describing what that is. I understand him to mean that one of the first ways we can reestablish the credibility of our communities, parishes, schools, universities, and whatever else in between, is by becoming missionary disciples again. But in order to see that in its proper context, we have to go through three steps. And we can do them briefly. The three steps of what we call evangelization, bringing the euvangelium, the good news. It's very three simple steps. Blessed Paul VI, in his document, Evangelii Nunciandi, in the 22nd article, defines what evangelization is. He says, it is, and I quote, it is, there is no real evangelization, the giving of good news, unless the name, teaching, life, promises, kingdom, and mystery of Jesus of Nazareth, Son of God, is proclaimed, period. Evangelization is about Jesus. It's introducing people to the person of Jesus in the life of the church. That's what it is. John Paul... St. John Paul went step two and said, you know what, guys? You know what, world? That function that has existed since the apostles is now in a totally new world. So he calls it a new evangelization. Remember, this is the Pope at Nova Huta who stared down tanks on Christmas Eve when the workers came to him and he was a bishop and said, in this city, that communist Poland had created the first truly atheistic city, we need to reaffirm our faith. And John Paul, in the secret of those weeks, helped those workers to create a steel cross, which they erected on Christmas Eve. And because there was a traitor in their midst, they were met with over 3,000 soldiers and numerous tanks. And it was on that night that this ordinary man and prelate, bishop, had to make a choice, either blink and walk away or stand firm. And he stood firm for six hours, and who blinked were the communist authorities, and the rest, my friends, is history. It was in that experience John Paul knew there was a new world being born. So, we can talk about the newness of evangelization in so many different ways. We could save that for our conversation. But it was Francis, in the end, who now, in his pontificate, is saying to us, okay, we know what it is, we know it's a new world, how do we do it? And he says it's missionary discipleship. And that means, my friends, three steps. 
So I'm Italian, I need my hands. Three steps. Step number one, you have to know your mission. On the day 9-11, when New York City was attacked, there is a famous story of a young man, a story of faith, who found himself in midtown Manhattan. And he was visiting, he was on leave. And of course, everyone who goes to New York starts their tour in Times Square. Where else? And that's where he was. And when first and second building was attacked, he felt this he felt impelled, compelled. He felt he was just deep down inside of him. He knew he had to go and do something, do help in some way. So he literally ran the entire spine of Manhattan because the subways had already stopped running. And when he arrived at that sacred place, Ground Zero, in this man-made chaos, darkness, carnage, blood, debris, he arrived not having any idea what to do. And in the midst of it, when he arrived, he heard this voice among these other screams, one distinct voice. And the voice kept saying to him, is there anybody out there? Can anybody help me? So in this man-made fog, this chaos, he found an older man pinned under all this rubble. And the man did something very peculiar. The man began to scream even louder. And what he said was, he changed his, what he was saying, he began to say, please do not leave me to die. And this young man looked the older man, took his hand, looked the man straight in the eye and he said, sir, I am a Marine. And a Marine never leaves his mission unaccomplished and you are my mission. And for almost 11 hours, that young man tried to, as best he could, dig the older man out of the rubble and stayed until the first responders arrived. So step one, what is mission? Mission is having a clear purpose and resolve to get a job done. And what does the Lord teach us is the mission? The Lord says, go out and teach all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Our mission is to bring the person of Jesus to a waiting world. Our mission is not to have the world come to us. Our mission is to go out into the world. And let me just say this too, quite frankly, no matter whether you're old, middle-aged, or a tad bit older than that, young and any age, nobody wants to commit to mediocrity. Nobody wants to commit to ambiguity. Tell me clearly what is expected, and I will rise to the occasion. I see that in the young church everywhere I go in this country. They are waiting for, they're waiting to be asked. And that, my friends, is the mission. The mission that you and I have been to go forth and make the person of Jesus present to those who are in need. Which then leads to part two. Part two is, my friends, is the literally the going out to those in need. I remember when I grew up in Brooklyn, right? We used to go Palm Sunday Mass or Easter Sunday Mass. You would have to go 20, 30 minutes to go to Mass to find a seat. The only thing they did, the pastor did, was open the door and people came. Now what the Holy Father is saying is, you have a clear mission. It's all about the person of Jesus, to bring his love into the world. Then he's saying step two is go out. Go into that zone that makes you uncomfortable. Go to the periphery. Go to the shadows of society. Go wherever you will be received to those in need. And need means spiritual need, it means physical need, it means social need, it means psychological need, it needs any form of poverty, any form of, of, of wanting and longing. We are to go out to those people. 
Now consider for a moment the implications of that for us. Concretely for the Holy Father, what he's really saying is we do it in acts of charity and mercy. Okay. And why is this at the heart of credibility of the church? Because in my mind, simple as it is, it's a very simple progression. At the heart of Christian faith is one statement. At the heart of all revelation is the explication of one mystery. That mystery is God is love. Not that God loves. God is love. And if you consider that being the central mystery of our faith into which God the Son can take flesh so we can be saved and redeemed, then in a world where love is spoken about but not experienced, in a world where too many people neither feel loved or lovable, where too many people, young and old alike, do not believe they are worth much, and they do not, for the best of whatever intentions around them, they do not feel cherished, nurtured, that they matter. The saying, God is love, in those people's lives, is a myth. It's a nice gesture. Sounds like a great idea. And then any religion that espouses God is love will look as a set of rules and regulations. And nobody necessarily will like a set of rules and regulations. And worship is just ritual. And a hierarchy is an oppressive force. And they say, thank you, but no thank you. I'll go off on my own. And why is the Holy Father then saying, going out to those in need? He's saying the works of charity and mercy because Jesus says, where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there. But there's one other thing. Let's get down and dirty for a second. Not literally. There are two ways to look at mercy. Let me give you one. Persons in need. Let me give you a helping hand, and I'll pick you up. That's what the world means by mercy. That's what the United States government feels, thinks is. That's what the Red Cross does. That's what a lot of people do. You're in need. I'm going to give you a helping hand to pick you up. That's great. That's not what Jesus said. That's not what Francis says. He says that is not our mission. That is not going to reestablish the credibility of the community. What he says is, this is how you do mercy. You get on your knees and you put your hands under the person in need. Bring them to you, to your heart, and pick them up. See the difference? You get into the messiness of life. You get yourself dirty with the brokenness of life. And he says, smell like the sheep because you're literally bringing them to your heart. See, and when we do that in a thousand different ways, love is credible, the community is credible, and Christ is alive. And that is what the Holy Father is asking to do the evangelization, how to do it. And if that's not enough, step three is the absolute icing on the cake. Because what the Holy Father is saying is if you're going to have a clear mission and you're going to do this going out in need, then he says you have to do it one person at a time. The theology of accompaniment, companionship, or what I like to say, spiritual friendship. Every person's story is different. There are infinite ways to break the human heart. And if our hearts are going to be healed, a program or an initiative is not going to do it 
anymore. It starts the conversation. But the one-on-one -on -one companionship, that ministry of heart-to-heart, -heart, is what's going to do it. My friends, do you realize how revolutionary that is? Let me give you two corollaries, and then I will wrap it up. I want to hear from you. I was a pastor for four years in a parish in Bensonhurst in Brooklyn. And I had 700 students in religious education. Okay? Had a great staff, great catechists. And we had religious ed like normal parishes do. First grade, second grade, third grade, communion, confirmation. I am not saying all of that is going to go away. Because it never will. We need it. But I think back to a lot of young people who fell through the cracks. And I'm not sure why some of them fell through the cracks, because they literally disappeared. And chances are, if the challenge of Pope Francis were alive then in my own heart, the outreach would have been, well, where did so-and-so, John, Susie, Judy, where did they go? Where did this family go? Because it could very well have been that in whatever need they found themselves, they didn't fit into the program. And how did we respond when people don't fit in the program, whatever the program is? The Holy Father is saying, the time has come to make sure everybody fits. Nobody's left behind. There's a hand offered to everyone. And so the implication is this. The Vatican Council taught us that every baptized person, especially the young, need to take leadership in the church. What Francis is saying is we have to raise an army of the baptized to do this. Or the way I put it, discipleship is not a spectator sport. We're all involved. And can you imagine the life of the church if everybody was given the opportunity and the means, the support, to enter into this companionship, this accompaniment, taking their discipleship that seriously? Can you imagine the renewal of the church? What it would look like? That is Pope Francis's vision. And that's what he's asking us to do. And I will end by saying this. See the excitement people feel? My sense is people are ready to do it. They are ready to do it. And perhaps together, in our time, in these years, we will find the way to unleash that power for the renewal of the church.